good to see you as always. Um, and thanks to everyone in the audience for, for attending this. Um, we're excited to, to talk to you all. Um, and this is a topic that I think is near and dear to both of our hearts, both, both um, from, you know, all of, like, at least from my perspective, all of my past career. And then um, at Jellyfish, you know, we, we've been um, working with people like Patrick for, for years now. And this is something that is always top of mind, you know, with all of the customers that we, that we work with and partner with. So it's, um, and, and I think it's something that, that, uh, you know, can, can make or break your, your success as an engineering leader. So it's, it's, um, it's certainly an, an interesting topic. Um, just to do quick introductions, I'm Phil Braden. I'm one of the founders at Jellyfish. Jellyfish is a, a software company that's been around for almost five years. We make an engineering management platform that helps you measure and optimize um, what you're working on and bring data to discussions like uh, like um, asking for for more resources as part of as part of the planning process. And um, Patrick, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Phil, and uh, and thanks for fulfilling one of my my fears by dropping off a webinar right before we start. That yeah. and, uh, there were only two buttons to push. Or, much appreciated. Well, there was one button to push, and you were supposed to push none of them. So that's what that's what I <laughs> that's what I screwed up. Um, yeah, no worries. I'm I'm um, uh, Patrick Rubeski. I'm a, a SVP of uh, product and engineering at uh, RealPage. Uh, I came over as part of a acquisition. Uh, of a company called uh, Buildium that that uh, focuses in the uh, property management technology space. That's right. We 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 knew you way back when, and uh, Buildium grew a lot and then got acquired, and and so you, you've gone through, you've gone through like probably you know three different iterations of of this planning process and this budgeting process, at least just to, just since we've we've met. And uh, and I'm sure you've gone through different versions of it in in, in past companies. Um, so while we while we um, just to seed the the conversation for questions um, in the chat, if you want to speak up around where where in 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 your org you fit and kind of where in this process you participate, I think there's um, you know I've I've in my career, I've, I've dealt with this like as a product manager, as the person running product, as, you know, a co-founder and, and, you know, member of, of senior executive teams. Um, and so it depends, you know, a lot of this depends on your seat for sure. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of commonality to, to kind of how the process plays out and what, you know, what the considerations are and, and what maybe some of the constraints and some of the, the, the tips and tricks are to, to doing this well and doing this successfully. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, from, from a chat, like, are you, you know, is this something that you, you're responsible for, or is this something that you help, um, you know, help your leadership with, or, you know, where in the, in the, in the process you play, I would say just to get the ball rolling and then maybe Patrick, you can talk about, you know, a war story or two, um, things that come to mind for me on this topic, like, you know, we, the headline on this is make the case to your CEO, but I think thing one for anybody who's been around the block on this stuff knows that it's it's not just the CEO, right? It's it's often the CFO is probably the person who's doing the most like meaningful work on this stuff, um, or you know, or the finance team, depending on how big you are. Um, it's the rest of the executive stakeholders because you know everyone at, at a senior level is involved in in budget decisions to some extent, and it also um, you know, could be your board, right? And not in the sense that you have to go to the board, but more in the sense that budgets are approved by a board and trying to make changes to them along the way, um, you know, aren't, you know, fully up to any one person. So that's that's kind of like surface area of, of this discussion. I think there's also like a big difference between asking, needing to increase headcount or, or add investment off cycle Right, because something's coming up in the middle of the in the middle of the quarter or in the middle of the year, versus doing it as part of a, an annual or semi-annual planning process. Um, I think the considerations that you need to make are, are similar, but like the the leeway that you might have. I mean, obviously, in an in a in an annual planning process, that's explicitly the the goal is to is to ask for the resources that you think you need to help the company um, be successful in the coming year. Um, whereas if you're doing it out of band, it's usually because 
you know, new information has come up, there's a new opportunity to work on something, um, you have a better understanding of the things you're already working on, things like that. I think um, one other thought, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Patrick for, for the war stories, is that um, regardless of whether you're doing the, the annual planning versus the ad hoc, hey, we, we need to you know, spin up a new team to work on the new thing, I think it's um, incredibly important to be prepared, right? To to take it to take it seriously, even if you're at a at a company that's that's kind of casual and still in in startup growth mode, because inevitably, um, you know, as the decision you know gets you know through the CFO and like measured against board plans and so on and so on, you, you know, you should expect to be pressure tested on on any request. Um, you should expect to know. Uh, you should you should have a credible answer and even be prepared to accept what happens if you can't get the resources that you want or need, um, and you should be able to to like have to substantiate your request, right? Like know how your people are doing, you know who's new, how how people are ramping, are people you know struggling, you know do you expect attrition, you know making sure you have a good handle on the on the people aspect of your team, make sure you have a good handle on the work that you're doing. Are we executing against the roadmap? Are we um, you know, we, we're taking on a lot of other technical debt and other sustaining engineering. Um, make sure you understand the finances part, right? I think any planning process I've been part of, there's, there's usually some expectation around how the current budget's going to relate to last year's budget, relate to industry norms or targets that we might want to have in terms of percent of spend, percent of revenue, those kind of things. Um, and so just being you know, having a little bit, doing a little bit of homework to make sure you you understand all of those things. Um, that preparation will, will will go a long way to having having a good discussion and getting to the right answer. Not even just getting what you want, but like getting getting to what is the right answer for the company, and and bringing data for as much of that as you can, rather than just qualitative understanding. Um, you know, certainly goes a long way. So those are things that I've learned. You know, at at every stage of company, and both directly and indirectly. Um, Patrick, I think it'd be super interesting for the audience around what you've, you know, like an example of, of, of how this has played out in your, in your career. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, all of the things you highlighted, Phil, honestly, they all make me think of, of, um, they're, they're all great points and they make me think of, of, uh, of areas where things have gone well and not so well, uh, for me in the past. Um, uh, even as I was preparing for this, I was, I was thinking I, I'm, I probably know a hundred ways how not to do this, uh, and I, I'm still working on the first success. Um, I, I, um, I certainly you alluded to to being prepared to accept no, and I, I like I think that's the easy one. Like I've had a couple of cases where you just you know like so much in the pit of your stomach, like this is a good idea, we need to do this. Um, but you're struggling to articulate it. You're struggling to find the, the right words uh, or not hitting the audience right, and 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 things tilt the wrong way, and 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 you've you've really got to be able to internalize, you know, because of things that are outside of your control. The answer is no. And um, I I died on that hill a few times, but I actually think that the story I would tell would be a little bit later in my career. It was in in my my earlier days at at um, at Buildium, and it gets to. Um, that's the bit about not being just the the um the ceo that you're trying to communicate with um i i had had many conversations with him over a protracted period of time about hey you know we we, we want to have some resources focused on you know x project and and um for all intents and purposes he seemed bought in he's like yeah that that seems like a great idea um and of course i'm hearing that the way i want to hear it which was like you know go right like it's 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 approved you you're, you're you're ready to go when in reality it was he meant what he said it, it's a great idea but, you know right. it's a story um and you know off i marched proudly into a um into one of our executive team meetings and and uh, it was a little bit of a master class in how a ceo thinks right and, and I, I mean as painful it was it was very illuminating for me um he did agree in principle when, you know, when he put his product and engineering hat on, he, he thought, yeah, it was a great idea. It was something we should do. But when he's in a room full of, of uh, his reports or even board members, um, he has to take into account how they feel or how they may be feeling. And um, 
what I thought was going to be a very friendly year, you know, was, was, was not. <laughs> um, um, and, and, um, uh, it, it really, it was a very painful, very public, like, wow, I'm, I'm just way off. And of course, this was also one that was out of cycle and all the other mistakes one would make going into it. So it was like kind of the perfect storm of badness uh, and very public and very, you know, humiliating. Um, but it did, it, it really taught me like, Jesus, I'm thinking about this stuff. I gotta, I gotta channel, channel my inner CEO. Like how, how is he thinking about it? How, he, how is he going to think about um, how, um, the CFO, the CMO, that, that they're going to conceptualize of it, um, and he's got to balance all those things so that he can make a good decision. And 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 it's not just what he thinks about my perspective; it's really what 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 is good for the whole company. Yeah, I think that's um like part of part of that story. Maybe that that seems like an especially uh, I don't want to say painful, but that like <laughs> that that you you clearly you clearly you you use the phrase died on that hill. But for sure. directionally, like that's one of those, if I had a nickel for every time, um, specifically for every time that you get like what sounds like general agreement, like, yes, we should do that. Yes, we that's that I, that will be a big deal. Like so there's support for doing, you know, whatever product and engineering initiative, like but getting from support for, for like go do a thing to like, let's spend some money. Um, is is a is a pretty is a pretty big gap, and I think, you know, if you're first time around the block, or depending on just like how well, like the leadership team communicates with one another, you could have what um what my head of sales refers to as happy ears, where like yeah no they definitely said we're doing this, <laughs> like and then you even you might even start you might have people working on it. Um, I've actually I've 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 lived through that one. Like probably my personal worst worst mistake on, on this front is the one where I um, get people spun up about it and like, you know, work begins, product managers are planning some things, maybe, you know, like a, a sprint of, of, of pre-work gets done all on the assumption that you're like, yeah, yeah, we just have to dot some I's and cross some T's on the, on the budget side of it. And like, that was just a full misunderstanding. Those were my happy years. I was happy years are a very real thing hearing that we're spending money, but that but like there was a whole other process that needed to happen. So I think that is definitely um, yeah, <laughs> like again, if I had a nickel for every time, the, the other thing I was going to say on the, on the being, you know, prepared to accept, no, I think one of the things that I've learned on this front and it'd be interesting to see how, how, how well this has worked for you, Patrick is, um, be, be ready to tell, be clear up front about what happens if the request is denied, right? Like, so, so that you're basically forcing the the organization to choose a little bit like this isn't a like make sure you know certainly to avoid the, the problem where they just say yeah yeah go do everything <laughs> go do more stuff without any more resources like obviously that's a trap that, that nobody wants to fall into um but then also making it you know making it more more specific around like well we won't be able to work on this other thing or we won't you know we won't be able to make any progress on on it at all like you know be be clear ahead of time that there's no um you know, there's no get something, there's no free lunch or get something for nothing, you know, answer in, the, in this, in this proposal. Yeah, I think that's right. You really, you, you want to set the, you want to set the table. I, 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 it's where I was talking about not finding the right words. Like you, you, you have to know your audience and you, and you have to be able to present, present to them the quandary as you see it, not the solution. You're already there, right? You, you've got there, you're, you're committed. You feel like I've got you know, I've got stuff, step A, B, C, and D that will get me to, to Xanadu, right? Like, and, and that's not, that's not what you want to do in a forum like this. You really want to present to them the thought process, how you're thinking about it, what the problems are, what the trade-offs are, that opportunity cost. Um, you want to get to that, that point of view around, listen, if we don't do this, this is what, this is what is going to happen. This is what we're going to be missing out on. This is what's going to slip. This is, um, and be prepared for that 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 grand inquisition and, and you should welcome it right you should like you know um whenever i present stuff like this i i usually end with like please come now shoot holes in this right here's kind of what i'm thinking here are the problems here are the boundaries um turn it into swiss cheese for me um kick over the stones that i haven't thought of um who are, who are you who are you asking and I'm, I'm this is for like benefit of the whole audience like 
who do you who who is good to like do that kind of pre work pressure testing and poking holes? Uh, like what you know who who would you do that with? I always like doing it with a with a CFO. I think to your point of of you know there's 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 lines in the sand and then there's the 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 the, the wall the very real wall around actually paying for something. Right. Um, um, you know, a good CFO is going to approach things very pragmatically, very practically, very dollars and cents. Um, um, and it's usually a very good litmus test. Although, honestly, I would I would recommend doing it with with whomever you feel most comfortable with in that forum. Um, someone who you trust, someone who you're really going to listen to. Um, um, I think you'll get you'll get good perspective wherever you knock. Um, I think it's really just being about you being more open to hearing it right getting right. those happy years right yeah well yeah and then and the you're, you're thinking of like lines in the sand versus real wall at the cfo i've i've also um i won't name names but i've i've certainly worked in environments where you know the ceo is is just as likely as the rest of us to have happy years mm -hmm. but then the cfo is the one that's like no 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 wait <laughs> like this this needs to add up <laughs> and yeah and so like until you until you're over that wall or whatever uh you know you're not done yeah um, i mean they'll, they'll try to keep everyone honest right they'll, right they'll 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 bring the good brainstorm conversations right yeah. back down to like okay this is what it really means yeah abs absolutely I, yeah i certainly I, like you know i think any any good cfo is 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 helping you know grow the business not just not just saying no to stuff but like but they're also the one that might be most in the details of like you know how, how do we pay for things and yeah and what's really going to work this this is a good segue to one of the questions um, from from the audience, which is, how do you get enough context? Or that was like in all caps, like just like if you're, you know, you don't have the benefit of you know a hundred mistakes, uh, you know, before this, um, how do you get enough context to think on behalf of CEO, CFO, and board to um, to really be able to close that gap between you know support versus like allocated money. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, why don't you? I, I have lots of thoughts on this, but like maybe you can take a, a first swag at this one. That's a really good question. Um, uh, yeah, so good that I'm going to give an answer that I'm not terribly in love with. But like, I don't because I honestly don't think there's a panacea. I, in my head, I'm kind of curious what you have, Phil. Is I, I don't know that there's like a a really easy tactical thing I could tell you. Hey, look, if you do this tomorrow, the day after, you're going to have like this pure context and understanding and empathy for how others are going to think about it. Um, I, I would view it more as, as, um, a longer term developmental thing where you're building existing relationships and you're having more ongoing dialogue with not just the CEO, not just the CFO, but all of your peers, um, both, both on the, um, executive team, but, but frankly also on the board, right? What's, um, it's kind of that longer term thinking that goes along with aligning, each executive function together um, that I think you, you need to put time and effort into building, right? How can I really, how can I channel my inner CFO or CMO such that it's part of my default operating mode, right? I'm, I, you know, I do it now and I actually kind of worry about it because I'm doing it like when I'm on vacation and I'm at home, right? Like, I wonder how my CMO would approach this problem. Um, but it, it's true. Like I think it, it, it you kind of almost become a, a a single consciousness, if you will, where where you know you all know how you're going to react and the the typical things you're going to probe on. And it, um, you know, honestly, I think that's when you get really, really good as an executive team, um, when you're able to have that shared consciousness and you're able to to you know you're not going to anticipate everything, but generally speaking, I know where I'm going to get pushed from each side of the table, um, and I better be prepared for that. Right. Well, yeah. So I, I think that's like some of it is like you know learn by doing and and you know just experiential. I do think there are are shortcuts. And well, in fact, actually, the first answer I'd give is you don't have to think on their behalf. You can actually just talk to to these people, right? Yeah. Or talk talk to their delegates. Like so that's that's why I thought it was a good segue from what you were saying of you know go go ask um, you know for you know for critique with the CFO as an early step or you know depending on the size and structure of your organization. Um, you know, somebody in finance, if, 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 you know, it's hard to get time with the actual CFO. Um, I think, so you, you don't always have to think on behalf of everybody else. If you can talk to them, I mean, the board 
is is like indirect and and so you don't have to like that one's probably not a, a normal thing any of us do is like go ask a board member about why we need to spin up a new development team um one of the other uh audience members suggested in the chat of like enlisting just enlisting the cfo to help you actually work on it i i think every cfo i've worked with would be willing to do that at, at some level for sure uh, either directly or indirectly like you know if it's a big fine if you know if if I'm if I'm junior and the, and the CFO is senior, like she might you know delegate you know somebody on her team to to work with me. But um, but either way, you can ab absolutely get help. I guess the uh, the only other thing I would say is that um, is this this goes back to the sales analogy. If like you're you know it's my head of sales saying like you know you, you get happy years because you hear what you want to hear. The the opposite of that in sales is to like do discovery and to and to qualify things. And so it's actually just learn what, you know, take the time to learn how finance thinks about the engineering budget, not just your new idea, but like the actual engineering budget. And do they have constraints and metrics that they need to hit? Um, how does the, you know, CEO and, and other, you know, members of the executive team think about that? Like if you know the overall, if you have good situational awareness because you've, you've taken time to learn about it, um, then you're, you're more prepared. So you don't have to like think like them. You just have to know some of it's like knowing what they know and, and you can get that by asking and learning and just making that part of your job at a certain level of leadership. Yeah. One, I'd give one word of caution too with the, the just talking to people is great advice, right? Like yeah. I think most of the time you do get a really positive experience there. And, and, um, the one word of caution I would throw out there, uh, and this is from experience at a company I won't name years ago, yeah. um, uh, it, where they had this, they, they, they had a name for this meeting. They, they called it a pre-meeting and, and it was part of corporate culture that you would, you would go do these pre-meetings. And it was, um, it, honestly, some of the real debates and real, the good, the good stuff from my perspective, where you're really getting into like arguing the principled nature of whether you should do something or not do something was marred by, you know, this game of Survivor Island around, well, who had had the right pre-meetings with who? And, and um, as you talk to people, just make sure you're not, you're not, you're, you're not setting them up for anything like that, that they know you're not setting them up for anything like that. And, and that, you know, it's really, look, I'm after your interpretation of my idea is not not your i'm not lobbying for your support in a public meeting because i've seen that happen a lot especially with people who are really new to it and and uh that usually doesn't end very very well yeah yes we could do a whole nother webinar on on company politics uh yeah <laughs> hopefully hopefully you have a decent feel for like whether whether there's you know political uh overtones to any any conversations any planning any you know debate um and and you'll tread accordingly but i do i think that's good advice yeah there's another question uh, from uh from the audience here that says we'd love to know how you would quantify against company top line metrics when it's hard to when it's hard to do that like and so i i i'm interpreting that question to mean um you know you want to build a new thing because ultimately you think it's going to help the company make more money um you know that's that's a hard thing for that that's always a speculative exercise no matter who's doing it it can sometimes be extra challenging for you know the more disconnected from the business you are um and so patrick i'll like I, i'll admit this one's just a hard question to answer so i'm going to try and stick you with it and see if you can answer it because because i can't um what, what's what's your experience been with like trying to like quantify uh, you know, ROI or what the return could be on, on something. Yeah. I, I mean, again, it's a great question. There, there are, there are at the grossest layer of simplification, there are two types of projects that, that at least I've encountered. You have those that are beautifully set up to tie directly to a, a quantifiable top line KPI, OKR, what have you, um, where, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's going to drive, uh, you know, sales of a certain add-on, it's going to, you know, it, it's very, very uh, tactile. Like those are the super easy ones. Um, um, and maybe that's again, a gross simplification because nothing's ever easy, but, but in terms of measurement, they're very easy. The way I'm hearing this question is things like, Hey, look, I've got, I want to staff a team on technical debt, or I want to make a justification to do a, 
uh, I want to theme roll a, a, a part of our application to make the user experience a little bit better. And um, the answer isn't as quantifiable. It's certainly in isolation. Um, where I usually go with that is, is, and again, I think we alluded to it a little bit earlier, is the idea of of think think about think about it as a as a um, plan, think about it as planning in the idea of a zero sum game where um, you have the the whole universe of things that that you can be working on and um, how much time are you spending in those areas. And what reward are you getting from those areas? This is, I'll tell you two things. This is the first thing I'll tell you. So really start to think about like UX is a great example. UX may not always be seen as something you can walk out perfectly to a top line metric, um, but you can say we're underinvested there. We're overinvested there. Um, we haven't done enough there in the past X many months, X many quarters. And I think that while not a direct way to, to walk it out, you can, you, can, you can say, look, from a macro perspective, if we continue to have declining percentage time spend in this area, you're going to have atroph atrophying UX, you're gonna have atrophying debt. Um, and those are things that are actually quantifiable, right? You can go right. do silly cyclomatic complexity scans and uh, you know, it doesn't take much to show that, that something like technical debt will accumulate if you're not paying it down. Um, um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, so I think, I think that, that, that's, that's good. And especially at the end, like, y yes, if you're, if you're already working on, you know, if you're having, you know, an increasing number of, of support issues, or it's taking increasingly longer for you to, you know, merge, merge code or ship anything, like those are all cases where like, okay, we need to invest to like make the world a better place. And, yep. and that's, um, maybe that brings me back to the, the the other thing I would add here is like it's uh, especially if you're coming from engineering and even product there is like a you know what are you the expert on what can you be you know trusted as the credible expert on versus what do you kind of need other people's support for and so even if I thought I knew like even if I thought as a product leader I had a great handle on on what um, you know what we could do to increase revenue I, if it's an enterprise B2B kind of thing, like I want that coming from my sales leader rather than from me. Like, don't just take it from me, take it from the person who's like kind of committed to this. Um, and I think, uh, so I think th that is a case, like if you're talking about top line ROI, like get getting support from it for it is, is, uh, is, is incredibly important if you're, if you're coming out of like product engineering. I'd also say that you, there is a, there is like a, um, you're in a much better position to point out the consequences of not doing certain things. Like, so like, yeah, yeah, we're going to build the, the new thing. Everybody wants to build the new thing, but if I don't have resources to fix the old thing, right, let's look at how much of our, you know, current business is, you know, current recurring revenue is coming from that. Let's look at our churn metrics or support load on that, right? Like, so, you know, this isn't this isn't meant to sound political, but like, it's, it's usually the case that will resonate more where you can create, you can point out like some legitimate reason for concern, like, and, and, and get people afraid of what they might lose. If, um, if you don't, if you don't do the things that, you know, you and your team know you need to do to, to kind of keep the, keep the lights on and keep, you know, keep the, the existing product line running. So I feel like that's sometimes more, a more successful argument coming from an engineering leader than like, Hey, we'll be able to sell 10 million bucks worth of new stuff. If you let me build self-driving cars next quarter. And yeah. It's, it's funny you say that, Phil, that was, that was the other thing I was, I was thinking about earlier is, is, um, um, you, so overall you really have to pitch the project. Like the answer to this is you have, you have to find a way, especially when it's not quantifiable or easily quantifiable, you have to find a way to pitch it. What's the, what is the destination we as an organization are going to be in when we complete this work? And why is it good? Why do we want to be there? Why does the CFO want to be there? Why does the CMO, why does your head of sales want to be there? Um, and, and you've got to be able to, to project that. But I would guard that with, with and, I, and I say this to, to people I work with all the time, it's got to be a no spin zone, right? Like mm -hmm. most people, um, especially at the higher levels in organizations, like they don't want to hear spin. They don't want to be sold. Like they get enough of that. Like, um, right. You know, don't don't come in and talk to me about how wonderful it's going to be when we do this project because things don't often go that way. Like, 
really ground yourself, really come at it from a genuine, straightforward look. Here's where we hope to be, you know, and maybe it's in gradients. Like here's your best case, your medium case, your worst case. Um, um, but but really try to avoid that that fairy tale sort of like, oh, we're gonna make millions of dollars hands over foot, like yeah. Um, be, be honest, be straightforward. You, you know, you really want to give your CEO, your board, your executive team, the right information to make good decisions. You don't, you don't want to spin them off. Right. I think especially coming out of, out of product and engineering, that's hundred percent. Like usually the most successful engineering leaders I've, I've worked with and met are, are usually low on spin. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's, there's other, there's other people on the team who are, you know, who are there to, to spin things, not the, not the, not the engineering leader. Um, there's a, there's, this is a good segue to uh, another question from the audience, which is, what are some of the things that keep your CEO awake at night that adding engineering headcount can help with? Um, I do think that I do think that you know my last answer was partly motivated by seeing this question pop up around, you know, if we don't do the things we need to do to keep the existing uh, customers happy and keep the existing product lines, um, you know, running, like that's that's one version of it. There's probably a a longer brainstorm that's that's worth doing here like i'll throw out i'll take a turn patrick and i'll let you like go um yeah. i think competitive uh you know is always a thing that we you know and as a as a product leader i you know i sometimes you, you have to be smart about when to worry about competition but but either way if you've got uh competitors that are that are growing and thriving and and especially if they're winning business from you um you know, being mindful of that and watching other people, it's, it's fear of missing out. Like, you know, the other companies building self-driving cars, like how are we gonna, how are we gonna compete with them unless we build self-driving cars too? Um, that I think as a CEO or founder can, can sometimes either rightly or wrongly keep you awake at night. What do you think, Patrick? I agree hundred percent with, with that. I, I, I just jotted down three, three things that immediately came to mind. I'm actually going to ask my, my CEO too, cause I'm kind of curious. <laughs> yeah. Rattle them off. And I, I really hope I'm right now. Okay. Um, um, the first was security. Uh, I think in the climate we're in, I think there, there aren't many people that want to end up on the front page of the business section of the New York times. Um, that's happening with, with increasing, um, frequency and, and, um, that's the sort of thing that's happening these days where if it happens and you aren't doing, um, what a, what a public forum could consider reasonable, uh, job at trying to prevent it, then, then yep. you, you could be in a bad spot. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's interesting because that one is, isn't one that I would have said five years ago was a CEO that would, that like, there are definitely people who, you know, stayed awake at night over this five years ago, but it usually wasn't the CEO. I do yeah. think it's become a first class problem now to the point where like, you know, the buck stops, you know, all the way at the top. Correct. Correct. And, uh, you know, downtime is the other one I would, I would, I would put in there. And I think it's the same vein. I think a couple of years ago, probably not so much, but nowadays it's, it's, if you're down, like they're not calling me, they're calling the CEO. Like why, why, you know, this is not a world we live in where it's, it's, um, it's acceptable for, for your product not to be accessible. Um, that's, and then a, last, that's, a, that's a tricky one though, right? Because like if you're the engineering leader and I'm the CEO, I'd be like, yeah, you shouldn't have downtime. <laughs> like, <laughs> like why, why, you know, that's priority number one, you know, like, yeah. like the security one I get, I resonates hugely because like the, I think we're, we all have a front row seat to like the, the increasing levels of investment and, and responsibility that companies have for it. Um, but the downtime one is like, it can be a dicey. I don't know. Do you have, do you have any do you have any tips and tricks on how to like you know bring that up without without like driving yourself into a ditch? No, I mean I think it is it is it's a little bit of that, but it's it's to me I kind of lump them together, right? It's it's look these are the table stakes we we have to have, right? We have to have the right bodies here because these things can't happen. Yeah. Um, um, cool. Yeah. What, was your, what was your third? I want to make sure we don't forget. Yeah, you. the last one was uh, it's kind of a play on yours. It was really just a relevancy. And this is both from a product and a platform standpoint um, that, you know, we're, we're either getting into that position from a technical standpoint that the platform is unusable in that classic state of like, you can't iterate on it because there's too much debt or we can't find an engineer who can work on COBOL anymore. Um, uh, or from a, a product standpoint, right? You've, you've just painted yourself into a, into a corner and you're not innovating enough. You're not moving forward fast enough. Um, you didn't, you didn't keep your eye on the second and third horizon enough. Um, I think those things are in a very fast moving, um, 
environment. Um, they're, they're things that certainly would keep me up at night. Yeah, I think those are good. I think one more one more that I'll throw on here is uh, especially if, if you're either earlier stage or just in, you know, a high, you know, hyper growth mode is, um, you know, if I'm the CEO, I, I'm, I'm worried that we will not be able to take advantage of the opportunity. We won't be able to scale and execute fast enough. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so like the way that this manifests in like we're, we're going through it now at, at Jellyfish, um, and I'm sure everyone's had to do this at some point in their, in their planning. It's like, one, I need to, across any function, I need to make sure that we have enough people to do the, the work that we know and th that we know about and that we want to do. But then you also need to make sure you've got like the management infrastructure and the bench, like, right? Like if, we're, if, we, if we have 20 engineers worth of work to do in the second half of the year, well, we need to make sure we have 20 engineers but if we also you know think we have 40 engineers worth of work to do in you know the first half of next year that means we need to have you know at least two or three more engineering managers and we need to think about you know how people are again promote getting promoted and performing and yeah, what yeah. The strength we have and, and so if i'm a ceo i I'm, I'm sometimes worried that like do i have like does everybody have a high enough ceiling? Do I have enough bench strength, like, you know, you know, underneath like the, the leadership and, and, um, you know, so, so, and which, which by the way, like that, you know, if, if this is how to convince your CEO to, to increase engineering headcount, like baking that into your, into your plans, uh, can be a winner for sure. Um, and also speaks well that you're, you know, thinking, correctly about about how to how to scale yourself and your teams and, and and everybody in between yeah that's a great one um so I, I think in terms of in terms of questions from from the audience like those are the those are the ones that that, that I've seen so far um I think that uh you know other other tips that that I've you know one of the notes that I jotted down before this thing was like um especially as it relates to out of cycle planning, um, you know, where you're not going through the whole big, you know, annual or, or semi-annual thing. Um, it's, it's often a lot easier to ask to bring forward headcount or investments than it is to um, add them. Yeah. Like, and even just like, even those words, like where it's like, look, we're going to hire more engineers eventually. I just want to hire them like now rather than like, you know, four months from now. Um, that, that can be a, a much better, uh, you know, argument to, to get, cause it's just an easier thing to say yes to you're, you're kicking the can down the road of whether you need to, to really add or not. Um, so like, that's just a tip that that's worked for me in the past and, and would work on me now if I'm on the other side of the table. Yeah. Um, I think another, uh, another, another, um, another thing to, to, uh, keep in mind when you're doing, especially when you're doing off cycle, uh, planning is, check with finance to see where you're, you're at against the current budget. Like sometimes you might be in a myopic version of like, okay, I have this many teams or people, and I'm just talking about adding teams or people, but it's, you know, did we hire those people on time or maybe we were a few months behind on every hire. And so there's just a lot more money that could be spent because we're behind on the actual hiring. And then there's every other thing that you spend money on. Maybe we're, maybe our AWS costs are, you know, under, under what was projected or, you know, all the other, um, you know, tools and, and infrastructure spend that goes into the, the R and D budget, or maybe even product is lumped in and we're behind on product hiring, um, you know, figure out where, but, you know, before you, if you, if you know, you want to ask for money and you know, you have a good reason to do it. Um, it's good to, before you even ask, just like figure out how much money might be, might be available because, uh, cause that could make this a painless discussion. That's an important one too, right? Like you don't, you don't want to, poke the bear like you don't want to start a conversation that 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 could be you know uh e even if it's not an even steven sort of financial situation if if it's right. you're close enough sometimes you're close enough right like being a little over and asking for a uh, saying you're sorry is a lot easier than starting a whole big thing um to talk about something you could have done anyway right well and and, and another version of poking the bear like the double-edged sword of this is um if you're if you we're unaware of the fact that you and your organization have been spending more money than you plan to <laughs> like, and just nobody, nobody yelled at you or nobody complained about it yet. Like it'd be good to know that before you go ask for, 
when you get to that wall <laughs> of the CFO and the CFO reminds you that you're actually 20% ahead of of what you what you said you were going to do uh, at the beginning of the year, like you should know that ahead of time. Hopefully yeah. you're 20% behind and then you can just get a freebie. Yeah. But, uh, but either way, like that's part of being prepared for sure. I think I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A, like the Q&A has, I think we've answered uh, all questions. Uh, oh, we got a new one. Uh, so we definitely have time for it. Um, what happens if you overshoot engineering headcount? Patrick, like you must have done that before. What happens? I don't think I've ever uh, overshot headcount, um, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, hiring is hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always been, so I'm, I'm, I'm local to Boston. I've always been hiring um, primarily in the Boston market, um, but using teams in India and, and Europe. Um, um, where I, I, again, it's always been competitive. Uh, I, I can't imagine. I, I I'm trying to think. I, I I can't. Nothing's coming to mind where 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 I was in. I was blessed with an easy market to hire in. Um. Um. I mean, I. So I I guess the way I would I, the best way I would say to answer that is is. You, I've also never been blessed with a, a situation where there isn't plenty to do. Right. <laughs> um, I think to me, it just gets down to like, okay, if you really get into that situation, you've got X percentage over in terms of staff, how solid is your backlog? How solid is your long-term, mid to long-term three to five year strategy? Like, where are you going? Would you spin up another product team? Would you pay down debt? Would you work on the platform? Would you, you know, is, is there another direction that you could bring in? Is there a market adjacency you could be hitting? Um, I think you would pivot from a more reactive or defensive or keeping up standpoint in your strategy to more of an aggressive, okay, look, because of a, a mistake, we are over our skis in terms of hiring, which means we're paying more from for than what we expected or, um, or, 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 or we're ready to do in output. Uh, and okay, can we use that in a, in a more of an aggressive posture to get out there and get after can we show value beyond what we had committed to doing? Um, yeah, I, I, I like that answer. Like if, if for whatever reason, like the company has decided that you're over, that you have overshot engineering headcount, um, you know, if you're the engineering leader, I would, I would assume you want, you always want as much control over the situation as you can. And the way to have the most control over it is to keep, you know, keep your team delivering. And, and, you know, you, you mentioned good backlog, you know, just, uh, you know, just, doing always be shipping and, and always be doing stuff. I think the other, you know, in, in my experience, the only time that you really find yourself over having overshot engineering headcount is, you know, as you know, a year ticks by or as quarters tick by and you understand the you get new information on the trajectory of the business. It's not that you actually actually hired engineers too fast. It's more that your plan of, the of, business of how, how much you, you should and can spend on engineering is no longer is no longer what you thought yeah and, and so that's one where again like I, you know to patrick's you know point i'd rather have control over the situation where you know there's not pressure on me no one's thinking that my team is 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 wasting their time and nor am i complaining that my team can't do things because you know we you know we we have you know other other departments haven't caught up or something like that um but then once i have control over the situation like you still might be in a in a, in a place where you have to, you know, you have, you might have to let some people go. Like you can't afford to, you're either gonna have to, you know, freeze the team and keep it, it flat for a bit, or, or you may have to reduce. And I think what, like not giving anyone advice on how to, how to deal with those situations. Cause those are, you know, very circumstantial and situational and, and, and so on hard. Um, I would say being prepared for it, just like so. One thing you should be prepared for, Patrick already said, like you know, have a good backlog and make sure you're 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 working on high value things with your overshot engineering team. I'd also say that if you feel like you've overshot, you have too many engineering heads, be super up to up to speed on how your people are doing, you know. And if you, you get ahead of get ahead of all the discussions of like, well, should we, you know, maybe we have to reduce or maybe you know we have to reorganize and stuff like that because playing from behind on those conversations is is another example where you lose control and, and you make a hard situation even harder. 
Yeah, it's it's a really interesting way to think about the whole conversation if you think about it, right? Like, and, and admittedly, I've never found myself in this situation, but I, I think if you if you look at not wanting to be in that situation because you're right, Phil, like that's that's a scary situation where you could be looking at having the riff, uh, which frankly, when you're talking about hiring, that's the last thing you ever want to get to, where you're you're letting people go because you don't have work for them. That that that's your fault as a manager, as a, as a the person behind the strategy, and and I and I think. For me, going in, it's it's kind of the reverse look at the question, and it's a little bit of an under underhanded way to answer it. But I think you do have to make sure you're hiring very responsibly. Yeah. Um, and frankly, when you go into these conversations, you should be pressure testing even your own approach to what you need. You know, everyone wants to have that rocket ship type hiring, but is that really responsible? Can you, to what you were talking about earlier, Phil, with with making sure you you're doing that dance with managers versus contributors and mm -hmm. like. Can you really keep up with that? Can you really, you know, is what you're planning on bringing on in terms of new bodies, is that really feasible? Um, you know, you, you don't want to jump too far out of what is, uh, you know, realistic um, and executable because um, you do want to avoid that situation. You really don't want to be in a position where you, you've got more bodies than you know what to do with. And I would, I would hope most good teams would, would, would pressure test that to a point where you could be somewhat protected too because um, it's better to have fewer people not quite getting all the goals done than, you know, a, a, a glut of people um, looking for projects to do. Right. But, but as you said, you've never actually been in that situation. So that's like a, no, that's a reasonable no. thing to worry about only in so far as you don't you don't accidentally like slow yourself down. Yeah. You know, you don't want to play. You, you know, you should you should be responsible, but don't be you know, don't be too conservative if the. If the business needs you to to help scale and help drive, yeah. Growth. yeah. Another thing I would throw it in that too is you, as you're thinking about hiring people, like one one of the traps I've I've been caught in before and try to avoid now is don't don't try not to think too much in terms of like project, because um, I think that can get you into that situation as well. Where like I need these people for three months, six months. Okay, yeah. well, what you need is a is a, a shop or staff augmentation. Yeah. Um, you be careful with that when you're really thinking about making the case to 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 bring on resources walk it out a couple of years how are you really going to use these resources what's the total cost of ownership of this project how many people do you need to build versus to support it um you know have that plan allocate for that plan plan for that plan i actually had an engineering leader uh that that i worked with in, back in the day who um would would maybe walk me into that trap as like the product leader of like Okay, you want to do X, Y, and Z, but the, you know when will those things be done? <laughs> yeah, when yeah, yeah. Products be done, and it's like, well, no, these aren't. It's never done. This, this isn't like a six month like go do the thing and then walk away. This is a you know we need to you know this needs to be part of our product line and it, and it will be a like an ongoing kind of evergreen commitment. Um, yeah, it's a it's a super great point. Like, because honestly, like when when I'm thinking about you know a lot of engineering and product resources come not at my behest, but they'll come at. You know, marketing has a great idea. Sales has a great idea. They're hearing things in the competitive environment that they want to get done. Like, okay, great. Let's talk about that. And let's think about what it really is going to be in terms of like, you can't think myopically. You have to think what, what, what sort of long-term product changes do you need to make here? Um, is it a whole swim lane that you're going to have for three years to really invest to the level of depth that you want to? Um, you know, it's a, it's a good trap to watch out for. Indeed. It's another, if I had a nickel. Kind of thing, um, so I think I'm looking at the clock. We've like we've done a good job answering all the questions. Uh, it's you know close to the top of the hour. Um, hopefully, this has been helpful for everybody. Patrick, thank you so much for for doing this. It's like super My fun pleasure. to do it, um, or or maybe do it for an audience. I think we could do this on our, in our free time without anyone listening. Um, but uh, but hopefully also for everyone in the in the audience, this is this is beneficial and, and interesting. And um, thanks for thanks for joining us for the for the chat. Thanks for participating.